You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. And our guest today is Karen Walker. And Karen is the author of No Dumbing Down, a no-nonsense guide for CEOs on organizational growth. Uh, she has been an executive at, at many companies, but most notably Compact, was employee number 104, if I have uh, my notes correctly, and so has seen companies' growth from many, many levels. And so I'm excited to talk with her about her insights, about the book she's written, and the guides and advice that she's given CEOs on, on growth. So with that, Karen, welcome to the program. I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Bruce. So why don't we start with learning a little bit more about your background. So I, I mentioned the combat experience. So give us a sense of how, you know, how that experience kind of formed your understanding of leadership and growth and then the work that you're doing with CEOs. Yeah, well, I was just fortunate to be in the right place at the right time when yeah. Compact started. And back in the day, we didn't have startups in the, I'm going to say this wrong, <laughs> proliferation that we do now. And I just, I was at a large Fortune 100 company and I noticed people leaving that I thought a lot of. Yeah. And so I inquired to see what they were doing and they hadn't announced any product yet. There was a lawsuit between the big company and the startup, so they couldn't say what they were making. Mm. They couldn't poach employees. So I basically left the big company and went to, start, went to work for the startup based on the strength of the leaders that were there. Yeah. And uh, that turned out to be Compact Computer, which was the then fastest growing company in American history. And um, it was a big lesson in leadership, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, you were there. You were there for a while, and you saw. I mean, you saw several stages. I mean, so um, oh my you know, gosh. not just yeah. the early days, but um, uh, you saw it really kind of grow through probably many different, uh, many different levels and transformations and and changes as an organization. I'm imagining. Absolutely. So I was there from. That that first year of zero to 111 million, and I left. We were four, we were 15 billion dollars, yeah. and it grown from 104 people, me, to about 17,000 worldwide. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, <laughs> I was there for for many different stages, and uh, you know, there's nothing like that that early startup stage, right? And then, yeah. and then what I think about is the big bang happens, where you you're just really clear, you've got your product market fit, and mm -hmm. it's off to the races, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, the remaining part of my time at Compaq, where I was um, a vice president in charge of all the global physical infrastructure, um, okay. was was all about making sure we had the internal infrastructure and support for the external growth that we were experiencing. And of course, we didn't know we were going to grow that fast. So we had to make, um, I also got really good at uh, dealing with ambiguity and being flexible and making plans for both um, greater than expected growth and less than expected growth. Although fortunately we ran into that, once. but um, yeah, I mean different. But I mean everything was different. The kinds yeah. of people that we attracted to the organization were different uh, in those different stages, right? You you start out with people who are um, who are looking for risk. Uh, in yeah. many ways, risk reward, right? Yeah. Uh, and by the time you're a $15 billion company, it's harder to attract people. And you tend to attract people who are a little more risk averse. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as a result, you know, the organization, the culture of the organization is just different. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine that. Uh, I mean, I've certainly seen in you know my own company and the companies I've worked with that, you know, the types of people that you need at different stages, um, you know, and, and different kind of versions of the organization can change quite mm -hmm. a bit. I mean, how much do you feel like you had to really kind of reinvent yourself or, or make big kind of changes or rethink how you were approaching your position and, and mm -hmm. kind of mindset, you know, as you went from 104 to 17,000 people? Yes. Well, I mean, certainly there were changes in just growth and development, my own personal growth and development yeah. as the company grew, right? I was in my early 20s. <laughs> I, had, I thought yeah. this was fairly normal. I didn't know quite how abnormal it was at the time. Yeah. And as the company grew, I would say the biggest changes happened when certainly when there was a, a change in the, in the CEO. Our founder and president CEO, Rod Canyon, mm -hmm. uh, was ousted maybe 11 years in. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, there was just a, a really strong emphasis on making sure that the Compact was a great place to work. Yeah. In fact, that was one of the key principles of the three founders. They started with, we're going to make a great place to work. And then they decided, oh, and by the way, we think we can make this amazing 
facing first portable computer for businesses. Yeah. And the value set, I think, of the new the new CEO was more on just growth. And, you know, these are not right and wrong answers. Yep. They're just different. Yep. And But as a result of that, my I would say my style was certainly more focused on the former because mm-hmm. I, I think you can you can grow and, and be a good place to work and not only not give anything up, but uh, those two can play off each other and, uh, and help each other do more faster. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the book. I mean, at what point did you, <laughs> I guess, when did you first uh, consider writing a book? What was that process like? How did you choose kind of the subject that you chose and, and, you know, what, what was the motivation for it? Yeah. So I never thought I was going to write a book. I just didn't, (laughs) I've, you know, I've been a consultant now for 20 years and my work has all come through referrals or, you know, people who've worked with me, who go to a different company and take me with them, that sort of thing. And I decided a couple of years ago that it would be interesting to try to write a book because the writing itself helps you really codify your ideas and your principles. Mm -hmm. And so I got it sort of got into it that way. And I realized, in the process of writing this book that that what I had learned at Compaq and then the application of that plus the subsequent learning uh, with all of these companies and CEOs and leadership teams over the years really did boil down to just a few principles, sort of the basics. So this book is more of a primer, I think, for CEOs and senior leaders. Mm-hmm. It's not a tome, but just what are the what is the essence of what you really need to pay attention to to make sure that you can have your internal strategy support this external growth. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like, I mean, you kind of mentioned it before. It's like there's the plan and kind of thinking ahead. And then there's the dealing with whatever comes at you. (laughs) I guess, yeah, I guess how much of this is, are you kind of helping leaders with the, with that kind of, kind of planning, forecasting, anticipating Mm -hmm. versus how much of it is, you know, being, being able to, you know, hopefully have a little bit of insight at something coming at you, but then dealing with things that are coming at you in, in the right way. Yeah, so I would say there's a good mix of those things in the book, these mm-hmm. five five strategies plus the avoiding the so what at the end. But the, the how to deal with things that are coming at you, I have a metaphor I use, which is called playing bumper cars, because we, we, you know, we get into the arena when we're playing bumper cars and things do come at us from unexpected areas, right? We get hit from all sides and often in our blind spots. And that can send us careening off in a direction that we weren't expecting. But what keeps you in the game is the, this idea of having guardrails. And the guardrails push you back into the arena if you're if you're playing a bumper car. And in a, in a business, you know, we make plans for growth, which yeah. we should do. And you know, and I know, and your listeners know, it is so rare that that happens in a straight line that we can almost <laughs> say it never happens in a straight line. Yeah. But instead, what happens is we'll grow faster than we thought or we'll not grow as fast as we thought. And then there'll be a correction, perhaps, to move us in the other direction. And this idea of playing bumper cars is that when you forecast your growth, just make sure you have your guardrails in place, both on the upside and the downside. We're usually pretty good about doing it on the downside, right? If my my sales aren't X, my revenue's not Y, I'm going to have to you know, take, make these changes in terms of personnel or whatever. Mm-hmm. But on the upside, the same thing is true because if you exceed your upside by too much, you'll begin to put a strain on the organization and you will find yourself in a place where you can't deliver on these promises that you made to your customers. Yeah. And as a result, right, then things start to get wonky internal to the company and, and that growth trajectory may need to be changed. And so um, what I'm suggesting is that you put an upside guardrail in place that alerts you to say, all right, take stock. You know, are we able to continue to grow at this rate or do we need to shore up our internal resources or perhaps change the direction, you know, to sort of Mm -hmm. slow down the growth a bit? However strange that might sound at some times, but yeah. just change the direction of the growth a little bit until you're able to get things more stable and functional inside to keep up with that growth yeah. and then take off again. Well, I think that makes sense. I mean, I, I guess my, my my general kind of you know personal experience as a CEO and, and all, many of the companies <laughs> that I've worked with is that we're more likely to suffer from overachieving <laughs> growth targets than the other side, meaning that you know more companies die of drowning than starvation is kind of the, the phrase that we like to use. You know, that growth side can actually be existential crisis <laughs> if not managed correctly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so there, you know, there are all kinds of ways to do to deal with that. One is just making sure you're aware of what's going on and mm-hmm. how your organization is dealing with it and then planning for how to get in front of it, perhaps slowing things down. But then, you know, something as simple as, as your hiring philosophy 
right? So one of the things we did at Compaq, and um, certainly I worked with my clients on, is you know, you don't want to hire so far. You don't want to get so far over your, you know, ahead of your skis that mm-hmm. that you fall. But do hire hire more than what you need, right? Hire people who can who can be there for the growth. And then yeah. if you don't grow, then you have a problem. You know, you have other problems to deal with. But if you'll hire, you know, one of the things we did at Compact was we hired people who were who could be there when we were a big company. This is an interesting and, one because I'm not sure. I think so many companies that are in this kind of a high, you know, fast growth, you know, kind of situation are are backfilling. You know, <laughs> they're trying they're trying to hire the people just to deliver on the work that they have to actually think about how to hire for people that I'm going to need in you know six twelve months ahead. Yeah. It is that can be a bit of a <laughs> mind bender or a, you know a big stretch for folks. I guess is there a is there a rule of thumb of you know your growth rate times six months. <laughs> uh, or something that you use, or how do you how do you make sure you're not going to get a front of your skis, but yet that you are yeah. on top of things? Yeah, I'm an engineer by degree, so I love formulas, but <laughs> I don't have a formula for that. What I will say is that the downside, of course, is that it's more expensive to hire people, yeah. just in terms of their their salary, uh-huh. uh, their benefits, their compensation, right? To hire to hire ahead and. If you have to replace a position, everyone knows that is super yeah. expensive yeah. because you, you've got not only the cost of replacing someone, but you also have the cost of training them. And maybe as or more importantly, you have the cost of your time and the cost of your leadership team's time while you're trying to deal with having the wrong person in place or trying to find the right person for the place. And you know, the time is the one thing that is the scarcest resource for anyone, particularly mm-hmm. for a senior leader in an organization. And so anything we can do to, to lessen and the drain on that. But you also, you don't have the foresight when you when you hire for today or end up really hiring for yesterday if you're yeah. growing because your company company's not a steady state. So it's really hard to hire for today. If you do yeah. that, you're already behind. Yeah. But I am a big fan of hiring ahead for most positions. And that way you have people in place who have who've perhaps been there, done that, who can see what the options are, sort of help you navigate what's prudent for the organization and the growth it's facing. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about some of the other recommendations in your book. So you mentioned you have five, there's five key yes. takeaways. Mm-hmm. Let's go through them. What are what are some of the, one, the first ones? Yeah. yeah, so the first one is just no dumbing down. Um, and I, I just stumbled on that phrase and I loved it because it's, <laughs> if, I had, if I have a manifesto and a, and a war cry, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> but dumbing down is basically teamwork as usual. And we've all seen it. We've all experienced it. Mm-hmm. When I work with, with uh, companies and I get leadership teams in a room and I say, all right, tell me about, you know, your the best team you were on and the worst team you were on. Everybody has been on a worse team. Yep. It's, it's just a matter of picking which one we're going to talk about. And those behaviors are often a result of people trying to apply these great individual contributor competencies that we have that have made us successful mm-hmm. to teamwork. Mm. And while there's some overlap between those two, they are not the same. And if you don't properly charter a team, if teams don't have the the tools in place to deal with conflict, if they don't have a way to align misaligned priorities, what happens is the team begins to look like a tar pit to your A players. And so they don't want to be there. Because if you've just got sort of one weak link, sometimes a team can carry it, but not, you know, rarely if there's more than one weak link, is that possible? And what happens is the team really can only perform at the level of its lowest performing member. Yeah. So that's the dumbing down. The, the rest of the team has to dumb down to that lowest performing member. And it's not always, in fact, even often that lowest performing member's fault. It's, it's usually they're not, it's not that they're not trying. It's that they don't have the right skill set or they don't have the resources or they've got different priorities that they were given or, you know, it's, it's not that they're not showing up trying to do a bad job. Um, and I think as senior leaders in organizations, it is our responsibility to make sure that the teams are in a uh, are resourced in a way and supported in a way that keeps dumbing down at bay. Yeah. Do you see, I mean, I guess you had an interesting comment earlier that um, people that are highly successful as indi- individual contributors, you know, come into a, t- a team environment mm-hmm. and, you know, start doing the things that made them really great as individuals, but maybe work against them as a team. I mean, I guess, is this is this something that you need to filter for or something that you need to kind of coach and train around? 
Yeah. Well, the first thing is just to be aware of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once people are aware of it, I always say there's the data and then there's what you do with the data. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people just being aware that they need different behaviors is enough. And that's great. Sometimes people need coaching and support or skills development in these other areas because they just don't have it. They've never had to use it before. And, uh, you know, all of us have these strengths that we we apply and that that have made us successful. And if we over apply them, they turn into weaknesses. And I think that happens on teams a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think it happens. It happens. Uh, I think it happens with CEOs a lot, as well. <laughs> you know, just Absolutely. You know, as they go yeah. from, you know, being, being that kind of founder, or creative innovator, whether it's they're a technical genius or a marketing wizard mm-hmm. or, you know, a sales guru is like they get into this leadership role and they realize that, you know, they've got to change and, and some, some make it and some don't, but, uh, yeah. you know, that transformation is, is key to, uh, to the next level of the organization. So what else, what are some of the other things that you find or that you help CEOs with? Yeah, there's a, another strategy I call double back. And so this is thinking about sort of startup to grown up, which many of us has have is a straight line mm-hmm. in our minds, but it's really a continuum. And I have seen young companies who are in grown up mode and I have seen old companies that were still in startup <laughs> mode. I like it. Uh, and my experience tells me that the, the answer is not either or, it is be in the place you need to be for the situation that's in front of you. If you are in a place that calls for sort of really seat of the pants, agile reactions, be able to do that. If you're in a place where you can apply process, which is the very grown-up thing, right? Make sure that you have a process you can you can rely on. Uh, but don't get so bound up in your processes just because you're a, quote, grown-up company mm-hmm. that you can't react and be agile. On the other hand, don't stay in startups so long that when process can help you, because what process does, right, is it makes things repeatable and scalable and, yeah. and you don't have to spend your time thinking about them again except to monitor the, the measurements you have for them. Yeah. Make sure you put enough process in place. Do you have any good tell Because I think this is an incredibly important mm. thing to get right from a leadership point of view. Do you have any good heuristics or kind of things that will give you some keys or some feedback that you might be too far one way or another in terms of what you see the organization doing or what you see, you know, responses or data that you're getting as a leader inside of a company that you either might be too far on the process side or too far on the agile entrepreneurial side? Yeah. So if you find yourself doing the same thing over and over again, or almost the same thing over and over again, right? It's the old 80-20 rule. Definitely put that on the list to have a process created. If you find yourself, and it's not always just you, right? Often CEOs and senior leaders have the ability in the organization to sort of do what they want a little more than the rest of the organization does. So I think it's important to talk to people in your organization, right? Do we have processes that are getting in our way, right? Mm, Um, or, Or often, you know, the question really is just, what would help you do your job better? And people will tell you, right? Yeah. I could get my job done better, but we have to do this thing X, Y, and Z. Mm. And either they don't know you have to do it because of some legal reason or some some other reason that, mm-hmm. that's caused it to be there. But maybe it's just that it was a good idea at the time, but it hasn't served you as you've grown. Yeah. Um, and that's often the case. So, so I would say, you know, sort of look look at what's going on on the ground and talk to the people in your organization. They can tell you the things they're having to do over and over again that, uh, that don't make sense. Uh, and they're also going to be able to tell you the things they're prohibited from doing mm-hmm. uh, because you have processes in place that don't support them. Yeah. It sounds like the, just that idea of, I mean, I'm certainly listening to your people, but also having, you know, having the, the culture or the willingness to kind of question and be curious about, mm-hmm. okay, well, yeah. is this, you know, does this really apply now? Or is there a way that we could make it so that it would serve us better now, you know, as a process or as a policy, you know, seem, seems to be a good indicator or a good rule of thumb for a lot of leaders when things are changing quickly. Sure. Think about it as like zero-based budgeting for processes, right? Ooh, I like so, that. Yeah. Right? So from time to time, just take a look at what's there and see if you've got stuff you don't need anymore or yeah. if there's gaps where you need to add. And then yeah. another area where I think it's important for senior leaders to focus, and uh, we just don't do this enough, and I know I'm guilty as everyone else, <laughs> is uh, what I think about is sort of learning to levitate or, or, you know, how do you create time to think for yourself? Mm. You know, how do you get out of this day to day? So urgent, you know, everything's urgent running from meeting to meeting. I think about it like playing whack-a-mole, right? You're going from (laughs) meeting to meeting and you are just flapping those moles back on the head and getting them in their holes. And then they pop up someplace else. And we could literally spend our lives doing that. Yeah. And many people do because there's no shortage of problems to be solved. The, The issue is you don't need to be solving all the problems and all the problems usually don't need to be solved. And as I say, certainly not by you. So to, to create time for yourself 
mm-hmm. to sort of step back, look at the big picture, think the big thoughts. I mean, this really is why uh, CEOs and senior leaders are paid so much. It's not so much of what you're doing, yeah. although it's good to have those technical skills. It's the thinking and the doing something with the thinking. And having an annual retreat these days is not enough because we have so much change going on in our lives and in our culture and in our organizations. Yeah. And so create time for yourself so that you can individually step back and and take time to think and so that your team and your organization can do the same. And then put a process in place to hold yourself accountable. This is what I call avoiding the so what, because how many of us haven't read a good book or gone to a great Mm. seminar where we've said, oh, wow, that would be amazing. And then we get back to the 300 emails and the day full of meetings and we do nothing (laughs) uh, except feel guilty about not having implemented. Right? So having some sort of both individual accountability structure in place But even better is to have some sort of team accountability structure in place so that the team can in a non-defensive way. So it's not like, oh, why is that person calling me out for not having done it? It's, oh, thank you for pointing that out because it's going to get in our way if I don't get that thing finished. But to have some sort of mutual accountability structure so that you can – have behaviors that match your intentions. Yeah. I'm curious about the, I I think this whole kind of urgent versus important is something Mm. that so many executives struggle with. And you mentioned, you know, setting aside the time, talk to me about what, what else you can do to create kind of that environment or that, that, uh, you know, mind space or mindset or clarity because i think a lot of folks Mm. you know it's not just the time it's the quality of the time (laughs) that they they choose or that they set aside what have you seen in terms of either successful strategies either that you've used Mm -hmm. or that you've seen your clients use in terms of creating the kind of the mental clarity or the mental space to be able to engage in these kind of strategy and important decisions that are not urgent oh that's the key right you have to create the space and you have to have the discipline to follow through with it adam grant had an article recently about, he said, let's not call it time management, let's call it attention management, because that's really what it is, right? And so for me, it's about getting clarity around what are the most important things. And this is not rocket science, it is not new to us, right? We all know, we have to know what the most important things are, and then we have to make sure that our days are filled with focus on those most important things. But what happens is we get bombarded by shiny new objects and uh, shiny new objects, you know, feel good. And for those of us that um, are problem solvers, just being able to jump to the next problem or pick up that next shiny new object and figure out what to do with it just feels really good. So it's a, it's a, it's the discipline of being able to stick to, I know that these are the most important things and why, because you can fall back on the why, Yeah. fall back on the, this is what makes this most important for me to spend my time on. Otherwise, you have to go through this thought process every time, right, about, oh, is this really the most important thing? Or mm-hmm. could this shiny new object be the most important thing? And then I would say just, you know, don't beat up on yourself. This is not going to be 100%. Mm-hmm. If you schedule time for yourself to think, you know, even, as, and sometimes this sounds like an outrageous amount of time until you do it, but, you know, a half a day a week, a day, a month, you know, mm-hmm. whatever it is, once you do that and you start having good results from it, then you're going to want to do more of it. And then yeah. there you are modeling it for the rest of your organization. So they'll get to do it too. The The problem comes in when other people try to try to book on top of that time, right? Mm-hmm. Because people are going to come to you with their urgent, important things, and they may or may not be urgent, important things for you. I have a tell you a quick story. I have a friend yeah. named, uh, named Mark Levy, who's a positioning consultant and Mark's really good. And he's, he uh, could spend his time from, you know, sort of sun up to sun down on calls with clients doing this work. But I was scheduling with him one day and he said, Hey, he said, I, I have a rule. I never book past four 30. And I said, okay, why four 30? And he said, because I go to the gym every day at four 30. And I said, well, that's really interesting, Mark. <laughs> why do you go to the gym every day at four 30? And he said, because I didn't for a while. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I stopped because a client had an urgent need. And so I I didn't go and I took care of them. And then that turned into two days and that turned into three days. And then I, and then I gained weight. (laughs) And then I found out that I, I just didn't feel quite as sharp as I, as I was. I don't know that anybody noticed, he said, but I didn't feel as sharp. Uh, and I, it just wasn't good for me. And so now I go to the gym every day at 4:30. I, you know, I'm, I'm healthy. Um, I feel good. I am at the top of my game and, um, and that's my discipline. Yeah. Thought, wow, that is so inspiring. And so I 
I, I don't go to the gym every day at 430, but I've definitely um, taken parts of that and incorporated it back into my life. Yeah. And I think that's and, and that is the um, you know, that's the key to a lot of this stuff is, is you know, investing, you know, in the, the time and energy and the discipline into making these things happen. Because, I mean, ultimately, you know, that, you know, going to the gym, I'm sure for him, you know, gives him then the mental clarity and the, right. you know, kind of sharpness to actually then create more value for his clients, probably a lot more value than he created by not going to the gym that one time. So Yeah. And um, now he, he now he's clear about the why. Yeah. So when he, if he has the twinge of, oh, I should make an exception for this person. And he realizes now everyone that's calling him is calling with something important. Yeah. Right. They're not just calling to give a weather update. Mm-hmm. But when he, when he starts to waver, he falls back on the why it's important for him to, to do yeah. that for himself. Yeah. Great point. Excellent. So uh, what other, I guess, any other, um, you know, takeaways or or things that you generally recommend in terms of uh, leaders in high growth, you know, in these kind of growth, high growth situations that will help them be more effective as the the organization changes? Sure. I I would say it's important early on to get some sort of rhythmic meetings set up with your Mm -hmm. senior team where you, uh, and I recommend for most of my clients that we do this once a quarter, uh, where we, we both look at, hey, you know, quick debrief of what happened. Uh, in the past quarter, what's happening in the coming quarter. That's pretty common. But also to take time to sort of have a look around and see if anything has changed that would change the planning you're doing for the coming periods. Right? Yeah. I think that's something we sometimes we sometimes fail to do is to take that, that debrief time at the bigger picture level. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and this whole idea of uh, debriefing, we're really good as a culture at executing. Uh, <laughs> we're okay at planning, yeah. and we generally suck at debrief yeah. and learn. Yeah. And so, uh, and if you don't do the debrief part, you don't get the plan, you don't get the learning, and then you go out and you you execute less effectively and efficiently than you could. Yeah. And so finding some way to get, I mean, both in terms of the content of what's going on, but also your process. Yeah. Um, I, uh, most of my clients will, will at every meeting, you know, how did the meeting go? How could it have been done better? Mm-hmm. And that's a, that can be a three minute conversation, right? It doesn't have to be the, the two day postmortem of a big yeah. project, yeah. but just to get the, the thought in of, oh, I can make this a little better next time. So those incremental improvements can make a big difference. Yeah. And it sounds like just the, the discipline and the rhythm and the habit of, of uh, meeting on a regular basis and then continually mm-hmm. improving on the, on the work that you're doing. Right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I'd say the last thing is just to find ways to decrease your blind spots because I know that's the one thing that keeps people up at night. It's the what don't I know? Because if you know it, you will do something about it. <laughs> the unknown right? unknowns, but, yeah. Right? But yeah. the unknown unknowns, the what don't I know and how, how can I decrease my blind spots? And so often, you know, by having a diverse team, and by that, um, I don't just mean that we have, uh, you know, sort of the, the today's definition of diversity, but also that you have diverse experiences yeah. and that you you have process in place that allow those diverse voices to speak up and to be heard and that uh, you try things that are outside of your comfort zone, you know, based on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, great points. We're going to hit time here. So, Karen, if people want to find out more about you, about the work that you do with clients, what's the best way to get that information? Yeah, so the very best way is my website, which is uh, karenwalker.us, all traditional spelling, karenwalker.us. On all the social medias, I'm Karen Walker US. And my book, No Dumbing Down, you can find that on my website, certainly. Um, or if you just go to nodumbingdown.com, uh, that will take you to one of the many places online where you can buy it. Great. I'll make sure that those are in the show notes so people Thank can you. click through and, and get to that. This has been a pleasure. The work that you, you do is uh, extremely important uh, to the companies that are in these kind of situations. So I appreciate your insights and taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com newsletter. 